service of the King. I am happy, oh so happy. I have peace and joy that nothing else can bring. In the service of the King. In the service of the King. Every talent I will bring. I have peace and joy and blessing in the service of the King. Take your Bible tonight and go to Ephesians chapter if you would please, Ephesians chapter 4, please, for our scripture reading. Ephesians chapter 4, and we're going to read verses 29 through 32. This is a familiar passage probably to most of us, and so let's just read it in unison tonight if we can. Uh, we'll just start in verse 29 and read it together till we end on verse number 32. And as our custom is, let's stand together to read the scripture. All of us standing please to read God's word, and let's begin together on verse 29 of Ephesians chapter 4. Ready? Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying that it may minister grace unto the hearers. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice, and be ye kind one to another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. And let's pray, shall we? Father, add your blessing, please, to the reading of our scripture here this evening. Thank you, Lord, for the wonderful music we've enjoyed tonight. Thank you for the people of God that have been faithful to gather in their place tonight for Sunday night church. And Lord, we're asking you now to minister to us through your word. I pray that you would quiet our hearts and we gird up the loins of our mind that we would focus for these next few minutes on what you want to say to each of our hearts tonight. I pray you'd bless the special now and we'd listen carefully and it would put our heart in tune with your heart, ready to listen to your word. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Make me a stranger on earth, dear Savior. Make me a stranger more like Thee. Help me keep my focus on heavenly treasures and not on earthly things. May it be. Lord, let me Bound for heaven, never to roam. Make me a stranger on earth, dear Savior, till I see my heavenly home. Lord, I found myself loving earthly treasures, simple pleasures taking your place nothing can measure to heavenly treasures hearing well done and seeing your face lord lead me onward as a pilgrim bound for heaven never to roam make me a stranger on earth dear savior till i see my heavenly home make me a stranger on earth dear savior till i see my heavenly Now, our fathers, we bow before you as we come to open up your word tonight. I pray, Lord, again that you would help each of us to 
ask you to speak to our hearts through your word tonight. Lord, open our understanding to this truth that we'll look at this evening, how we can be most like our Father, which is in heaven. And so, Lord, I would pray that you would minister to each and every heart. Holy Spirit, do what only you can do in each one of our hearts and lives tonight. I pray the Word of God would effectually work in each of us who believe here this evening. And we'll leave in a little bit saying it was good to be in the house of the Lord tonight. And we'll thank you in advance for what I believe you're going to do. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Many of the battles we fight stem from just one sin. Many of the problems that we deal with, the difficulties that we struggle with, all stem from one sin. And if you look at Ephesians chapter 4, where we read together this evening, God is dealing with that as we go down through. We started in verse 29, and he talks about the communication that's coming out of our mouth. But he goes then to the inside when he talks, tells us not to grieve the Holy Spirit of God. And then he tells us in verse 31 that we have to get the bitterness and the wrath and the anger and the clamor and the evil speaking and the malice all put away from us. All of that is in there. And we have to get that put away. And how do we do that? Well, he said you have to be kind one to another, tender hearted. What's the next word, church? Forgiving one another. Forgiving one another. I'll submit to you tonight that most of the bitterness, the anger, the wrath, the clamor, the evil speaking, the malice, all stems from an unforgiving heart. From that sin of unforgiveness. We do not forgive even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven us. At the root of the wrath and the anger and the bitterness is unforgiveness. Now, with that in mind, I want you to turn over to what Jesus taught about this in Matthew chapter 21. Would you turn over there with me, please? Matthew chapter 21. This is in response to a question. that Jesus was asked, I'm sorry, it should be Matthew 18, not Matthew 21. This is Peter asking Jesus in verse number 21 of Matthew 18. Peter came to him and said, Lord, how oft shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him till seven times? And Jesus saith unto him, I say not unto thee until seven times, but until seventy times seven. Now, do you think that by the way, for those of you who are not real sharp at math, 70 times 7 is 490 times. Do you think Jesus meant you can keep track? And once they get to 491, you don't have to forgive anymore? Okay? I don't think that's what he's getting at, does he? In fact, he's going to illustrate it for Peter to, to make sure he understood what he's saying. And he begins in verse 23, The kingdom of heaven is likened unto a certain king which would take account of his servants when he had begun to reckon, one was brought unto him, which owed him ten thousand talents. But for as much as he had not to pay, his Lord commanded him to be sold, and his wife, and children, and all that he had in payment to be made. The servant therefore fell down and worshipped him, saying, Lord, have patience with me, and I will pay thee all. Then the Lord of that servant was moved with compassion and loosed him, and forgave him the debt. But the same servant went out and found one of his fellow servants, which owed him a hundred pence. And he laid hands on him and took him by the throat, saying, Pay me that thou owest. And his fellow servant fell down at his feet and besought him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will pay thee all. And he would not, but went and cast him into prison till he should pay the debt. So when his fellow servants saw what was done, they were very sorry, and came and told unto their Lord all that was done. 
Then his Lord, after he had called him and said unto him, O thou wicked servant, I forgave thee all that debt because thou desirest me. Shouldest not thou also have had compassion on thy fellow servant, even as I had pity on thee? Notice, even as, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven us, even as I had pity on thee. And his Lord was wroth and delivered him to the tormentors till he should pay all that was due unto him. So likewise shall my heavenly Father do also unto you, if ye from your hearts forgive not most people their trespasses. No, you got the wrong Bible if that's what it says. No, he says, if you forgive from your heart, you not from your hearts forgive not everyone, his brother, their trespass. Here is the teaching of Jesus on forgiveness. Not just words you say to get two kids to apologize to each other. Forgiveness gets thrown around rather loosely and means different things seemingly to different people. Christian author Everett Worthington said this, It's more, forgiveness is more than just relinquishing judgment to God or simply accepting the hurt and letting it pass. True forgiveness occurs when those cold emotions of unforgiveness are changed to warm, loving, compassionate, caring emotions resulting from a heartfelt transformation. You know, I, I'm not sure whether someone sent it to me or whether I just saw it yesterday. I watched a little bit of it with Brother Moreland in the office but President Trump had somebody in the, I think they call that the Rose Garden or whatever, uh, doing a, a press conference uh, uh, of some kind. He was honoring a man for something he had done. And this man was a man who had been arrested as a bank robber. And in prison, accepted Jesus Christ as a Savior. And had his life transformed. Served his time and got out of prison, but that's not the whole story. Now he's done some things for which he was being honored. I don't even know what it was. What caught my attention was he named, President Trump named the FBI agent who arrested the guy. And he was there. And he called him up. And the two men embraced their friends. This FBI agent. Only a few weeks after this man had gone to prison, went to visit him because he had heard he had gotten saved. And the man told it with, that, that this man came to see him and said, I have prayed for your salvation since the day I arrested you. And now two men, the one who you think would the guy, you know, you always, the law enforcement always concerned about the fellow who they put in prison, you know, that when I get out, you know, I'll get you, you dirty rat, you know. And uh, I've... I've watched uh, too many uh, drag nets, I guess. But um, they, you know, to see these, I mean, you know what that is? That, there, so again, no, no harshness, no coldness, but a warm embrace and a feeling. Now, now, aren't you mad at him for us? You know, he's thankful. See, completely different. Completely different feelings. Now, forgiveness, you have to understand, church, is both an act and a process. Forgiveness is not the same as reconciliation. Forgiveness is not the same as reconciliation. It takes two to reconcile. It only takes one to forgive. It only takes one to forgive. Let me give you several statements tonight that I think will help you. Number one, if I do not forgive, God will not forgive me. The servant here in this story was forgiven for 10,000 talents. 10,000, by the way, was the highest number in first century arithmetic. 
So the number that Christ chose was the highest number they knew at that time. Literally, literally speaking, 10,000 talents had adjusted to our day and age would be probably at least a hundred million dollars. Other than Brother Wallace, there's nobody in this room that could pay that. <laughs> you understand, in a lifetime, you and I couldn't pay that. We couldn't come up with that kind of money. It's kind of rather absurd claim even when the man said have patience and I'll pay you all. Never. Seriously, if you had a hundred million dollars, do you think you could make arrangements? Or would you have to say, listen, I could pay from now till you know, I, I lay in the grave. You're not going to get a hundred million out of me. A hundred million won't go through my hands. Do you understand how foolish it was to even think he could pay the debt? And yet, the king shows mercy and forgives him. Forgives him of that debt. Let me ask you a question. How would you feel right about then? Hmm? I don't know about you. I think I'd feel pretty good. I think I'd feel like a big load was lifted off me. Say, man, I'm free. <laughs> I'm free. He just was threatened that not only him, but his wife, his children, everything would be confiscated, sold, and put against his debt. And now he's told none of that's going to happen. You're a free man. You don't know anything. I don't know about you. I'd have been thrilled to death. I'd be ready to, I'd be, ready to be kind to anybody. He goes out to another servant, another friend of his who owes him 6,000 pence, one talent. About a pence was one day's wage, so if you owed him 100 pence, it probably was about 100 days' pay. That's not a whole lot compared to 100 million. Remember what Jesus taught in the model prayer? And forgive us our debts even as we forgive our debtors. You think it would have been very easy to forgive after he knows how much he was forgiven. But he doesn't forgive. He takes the guy by the throat and threatens him to pay up what he owes. You have to understand why, why is it so difficult? Why was it so difficult for that man to forgive? But I got even a better question. Why is it so difficult for us to forgive people? I'll tell you why. Number two, let me give you statement number two. is because we must see ourselves as a 10,000 talent sinner. Do, we, do you see yourself as a hundred million dollar sinner in the sight of God? We, we, we tend to look at our sins like a hundred pence and other people's sins like a hundred million. Well, I'm not as bad as they are. We categorize sin and we have levels of sin. But God does it. Sin is sin in the sight of God. And the sin that we seemingly can see so easy in somebody else, God sees so easily in us. We forget. It's so easy for us to forget our sins against God. but so easy to remember anybody's sins against us. No matter how small they are. God's forgiveness of our sin is so extensive and so great. It, it covers not only forgiveness of my sin, but forgiveness my forgiveness of anybody else's sin. 
That's how big God's forgiveness is. We have to understand how much of a sinner we are in the sight of God. Don't, don't let what anybody else has done to you be bigger than what Jesus Christ has done for you. Jesus Christ paid for your sin. He's forgiven you of all your sin. He cleanses us from all unrighteousness, the Bible says. Extending true forgiveness to somebody else is a clear and persuasive evidence that I've been forgiven by God. The greatest evidence this man, gentleman could have shown by forgiving his friend of 600 pence was, well, 100 pence was that I've been forgiven a greater amount than that. I can surely forgive you after what the king has forgiven me for. Let me help you understand that. Number three, let me give you a third statement. It's not just sin that matters, the sin that matters, but the status of the one sinned against. It is not just the sin that matters, but the status of the one sinned against. Can I, can I help us? We're all, we're all $100 million sinners. In fact, we may be over the trillion mark in sin by now. Sin is black and wicked and evil. It rejects God. It rejects the one who is holy. It rejects the one who is light. God is light and in Him is no darkness at all. No sin whatsoever. You can only begin to imagine 1 Peter 2.24, where it says of Jesus, who His own self bear our sins in His body on the tree. When He died on the cross, the agony that He had physically from being beaten, from the spikes being driven through His hands and feet, from the beating from the Roman soldiers, the scourging across his back, from the joint bones being out of joint by hanging on the cross, my friend, that was not the biggest agony he felt. The agony he had was when he bore our sins on his body on the tree, and he had to cry out to God, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? was our sin your sin and my sin that did that to Jesus Christ when we begin to understand the hugeness and the magnitude of our sin against God we'll be able to forgive others of their offenses to us What kind of forgiveness does God give? What was Peter driving at when he said, how often do I forgive my brother? Seven times? That's more than double what the Pharisees would allow. And then Jesus raised the bar to 70 times 7. What was Jesus getting at? Unlimited. Are you glad God's forgiveness is unlimited? Are you glad you don't live through your life I've been saved now for over 50 years. Now please don't say amen, but that's a, lot of, that's a lot of sins to forgive. Think about that. If you just committed one sin a day, how many of you think that would be a pretty good day? 365 days a year. Multiply that by 10 years, by 20 years, by 30 years, by 40 years, by 50 years. Are you glad God has unlimited forgiveness? And that's just one sin a day. Most of us would have to confess there's more than that. God's forgiveness is unlimited. 
limited. I'm glad there's no quota. Now, if that's how God forgives us, how can we limit our forgiveness to somebody else? Well, that's the last time. They're never doing that to me again. That's just it. I'm nothing to do with them. Because I can't, I can't forgive them again. Well, I'm glad God doesn't take that attitude with me. Let me give you statement number four. Forgiveness is costly. Forgiveness is costly. There's three keys to true forgiveness. Listen carefully. Now, there's three keys to true forgiveness. Number one is repentance. Now, that's on the part of the one who has sinned. Is it sorrow? Yeah, but it's more than sorrow. There are times, and you know, there are times all of us have been there. You're, you're sorry and you're sorrowful, but you're more sorrowful you got caught than you're sorry for what you've done. That's why God never says in the Bible that we're supposed to say, I'm sorry. You know, we all had children, they fight, and you line them up with each other. Okay, now you tell them you're sorry. Sorry. You tell them you're sorry. Sorry. Okay, good. Now hug each other. And we think everything's great. Not everything's great. That's not forgiveness. Sorry never calls for a response. Never calls for a response. If I go in my car tonight after church and get in my car to leave and I run right in the side of Danny's car. Not paying attention. Danny comes out and says, Preacher, what are you doing? I say, oh Danny, I'm sorry. What does he say to that? Nothing. There's no response to be said to that. But if I say, Danny, I was wrong. Will you forgive me? Now he's got to respond. You know why sometimes it's hard for us to get those words out? I'm, will you forgive me? Because we know it's going to get a response. And we may get a response we don't like. So we don't want to say those words. For fear that someone will say, no, I'm not going to forgive you. We understand they can respond to that. Saying I'm sorry is just the easy way out. See, asking for forgiveness, asking, saying, will you forgive me? I can be rejected. And I can feel humiliated. I don't like that. My flesh doesn't like that. So I'd rather slip by and not have to face that humiliation and just say, oh, sorry. And move on. And hope you do the same. Did you know God doesn't want you to just come to Him and say sorry? Hoping you won't get any response from Him either. You know, when the Bible says in 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sin, you know, the word confess there is a word that means we must uh, agree with God about our sin. In other words, we're agreeing with God about what we've done. There's an agreement. So I have to begin to agree with God, see my sin the way God sees it. Why do you think in the RU program of the ten principles, the very first principle is, if God's against it, so am I. In other words, if God says it's wrong, it's wrong. Doesn't matter what I think about it. God says it's wrong, it's wrong. Because we rationalize things away in our mind. Well, I don't think this is so bad. Well, I don't think this is too... too well, I know the pastor doesn't like this, but I think it's okay. 
we, we rationalize it away. No, listen, if God says it's wrong, it's wrong. If God says it's right, it's right. That's, that's what, and so when God says something's a sin, it's a sin. I want to say the same thing about sin as God does. I don't want to smooth it over. I don't want to uh, not, not make it seem so bad. Not make it seem so black. Not make it seem so evil. Not make me seem so wicked. It's wicked. It's bad. It's wrong. It's sin. And I have to agree with God about that. You see, repentance is changing your mind about your sin. Well, I don't. When someone repents, when they get saved, they're changing their mind about whatever or whoever they're trusting in to get them to heaven and putting their faith and trust in Jesus Christ as their Savior. Repentance. So it involves repentance. The second thing it revolves is mercy. Now that's from the one who we sin against. Mercy is, remember, mercy is not receiving what we deserve. When that king who the fellow owed a hundred million to, ten thousand talents, when he just said, okay, I forgive you, you know what he did? He had mercy on him. He did not give him what he deserved. For his wife, his children, all his belongings, all that to be sold and go towards the debt, he'd have been his legal right to do that. They in those days had debtor prisons. That's what he was doing to the fellow who owed him just a hundred pence. It had been legally right to do that. But the king showed mercy. God would have had a legal right to send every one of us to hell to suffer for our sin. But He's merciful. We got saved by mercy and by grace. God not only not giving us what we deserved, but bestowing upon us much more than what we ever would deserve. That's grace. In mercy, like this king did, he released the man from his debt. He released him from owing anything. When you forgive someone, you have to have mercy. And you know what that does? It means you release them from any owing you anything. They're, they're free. They're free, and by the way, so are you. Because you've released it. We, re, we, we're releasing them from ever paying the debt, but we're releasing them from ever being punished for the debt. When God forgives us, the Bible says, your sins and your iniquities will I remember no more. God's never going to bring them up to you again. Never hangs it over your head. Probably if you've lived very long, you've had someone who one time said they forgave you and then a while later, here it comes again. They bring it up. And you say, wait a minute. I thought you forgave me. And then somebody says, well, yeah, I forgive, but I don't forget. Well, now, wait a minute. You know what? God didn't say He forgot either. God said, your sins and iniquities will I remember no more. It's a conscious decision on the part of God that I will not remember that offense against you anymore. And you have to make a conscious decision when you forgive someone that I am not going to remember that offense against you anymore. It's, your, it's an act of your will. It's an act of your will. So there's repentance. Three keys to forgiveness. Repentance, mercy. The third one is absorption. Say, so what does that mean, preacher? It means somebody's got to absorb the cost of the sin. Someone's got to absorb the hurt. You know why most people are bitter and angry and clamorous? Because they've been hurt and they're passing the hurt on to other people. 
There's very few people that will get hurt and say, the hurt's going to stop with me. What did Jesus do on the cross? As they falsely accused, beaten, crucified, nailed to a cross, mocking Him, spitting in Him, saying it, He said, the hurt will stop with me. Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. Jesus let the hurt stop with him. So you have to make a choice while I let the hurt stop with me. And the truth is, Christian, it doesn't stop with you. You just have to give it to the right person. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Casting all our care upon him, for he cares for us. What do you do when you've been hurt? You give it to Jesus. You give it to the Lord. He carries it. It does. Don't give it to other people. Whenever I see somebody who's angry and bitter and short, it, my first thought always is, I wonder who hurt them. You know, you know when, a, when an animal gets wounded and they're hurt, have a dog get wounded or hurt, you try to get close to that dog, what do they do? Man. They're ready. It doesn't matter. You have good intentions. You're there to help them. They don't care. Buddy, they're going to snap and growl and snarl anybody who comes close trying to help them. You have to let them know, man, I'm, I'm here to help you. And when you see a human being that is snarling and snapping and trying to keep that boy and seem like, you know what? Somebody's hurt them. And so they're just lashing out. They're not letting the hurt stop with them. Now, that's not a natural response. That's got to be a supernatural response to absorb the hurt. If you don't absorb the cost, you'll continue to hold the sin above somebody else's head. And that will become a root of bitterness in your life. That's where Ephesians 4 says you have to get the bitterness, put it away. Hebrews 12 says it'll be a root of bitterness that'll spring up and it will defile many. Everybody knows. You, if I, when I talk that way, some of you right now in your mind, you, you, you know somebody who's that way. I hope it's not you. But you know someone who it is. But you've, who's, who, who tends to be that way, and you think, wow. I'll guarantee you, I'll guarantee you, if you can break through that and get them to talk about someone's hurt them, and they've never forgiven them. And now there's a root of bitterness that has sprung up in them. So, well, Pastor, how do I know if I've not forgiven somebody? Let me help you. If you've not forgiven someone, you never want to be in the same room with them. The mere mention of their name makes you cringe. If you hear something that has hurt them or made their lives uncomfortable, you're not really sad. In fact, you're kind of glad. You think, well, they finally got a little of what they deserve. Or good for them. In short, you're kind of rejoicing at the bad things that have happened to them. But the chief mark that you're really not forgiven somebody is that whenever their name comes up or that situation arises, you tell the story all over again about how you were hurt. You keep repeating it over and over again. And we do that because whoever we're telling the story to, we want them to dislike that person as much as we do. And we're trying to spread it. That's why we're trying to pass that hurt on to other people. Number five. Got to keep moving. Number five. We only absorb the cost by the grace of God. What's the grace of God? I know we're, we're, it say, well, it's just His undeserved favor. It is that. But I think it's even more than that. 
I think when, when Paul said His grace is sufficient for me, that's what I think grace is. Grace is God's sufficiency for me in any situation. God will give me the sufficiency to handle any situation. It's, if we're to forgive even as God has forgiven us, I'm going to need God's help for that. I'm going to need God's sufficiency for that. How did Jesus do it? Jesus, Jesus didn't do that as God. Jesus did that as a man. Well, how do we know that? For ye know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. That though He were rich, yet He became poor. That ye, we, through His poverty, might be made rich. He did that by the grace of God. Why? He told us we could follow His steps. You can't follow his steps if he acted as God. We'd all made the excuse, well, yeah, Jesus did it, but he was God. Yeah, but Jesus did that as a man. He yielded to God. Let me give you the last one tonight. Number six. Forgiven sinners forgive sin. Forgiven sinners forgive sin. Sin. That's how, that's how sinners relate to each other. We forgive one another's sin. We forgive them of their trespass. Forgiveness originated by God, demonstrated by the Son, and commanded by the Holy Scriptures. Forgiveness. To forgive others, we have to see how great and grievous our sin is to God. And you know, when you forgive somebody else, it transforms them. It transforms you. It changes you. A private was in the military. He's a Christian. But always take time to open his Bible up and read it. And he had a sergeant that was very much against Christians. Always giving the man a hard time. Berating him, cursing at him. One night the sergeant came in late on a weekend night and he was pretty drunk. He looked down and saw the little light on and saw that private reading his Bible. He took off his muddy boots that he had on from being out in the wet night and he took one off and threw it at the guy. Hit the private. Took his second one off and fired that at him as well. Cursed a few words at him and then went into his room to go to sleep. But when he woke up the next morning, he opened his door and his boots were sitting right outside his door. Clean and shined, polished, ready to be worn. And it broke his heart that someone would do that after the way he treated them. Forgiveness is a powerful tool. Who is it that you need to forgive? Who is it that has the a hundred pence against you and you are grabbing them by the throat demanding they pay you? Forgetting the fact how much God has forgiven you. We're most like beasts when we kill. We are most like men when we judge. But we are most like God when we forgive. Be ye therefore kind one to another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God 
for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. Let's pray, shall we? Father, take the truth now this evening. Thank you for everyone's attention tonight. And Lord, I know when it's very, very quiet in the room, you're dealing with our hearts. This is a subject that I know through experience and through counseling and through just speaking with people that people struggle with. And you knew we would. Maybe that's why you reiterated to your apostles that if they do not from their hearts forgive their brother is trespassed that you will not forgive them. We all need your forgiveness. And we're all thankful for your forgiveness. Help us to forgive even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven us. Heads, heads are bowed and eyes are closed. I'll finish praying in just a moment. I wonder tonight, I wonder how many believers say, Preacher, the Lord has spoken to my heart tonight. I've been, I haven't been like God. There's been wrongs done to me, and I have not forgiven them. But, Pastor, based on what God has forgiven me, I know I have to forgive the ones that have wronged me. Will you forgive them? Will you forgive even as God, for Christ's sake, has forgiven you? I wonder how many folks here tonight would say, Preacher, the Lord has spoken to my heart. And there was some unforgiveness, and I'm asking God to help me with His grace to forgive those that have trespassed against me. Pastor, pray for me this evening. Will you slip your hand up? Amen. 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 You may put them down. The moment I'll pray, and we'll have our invitation. God has spoken to your heart. Do business with Him tonight. It's a wonderful thing to be forgiven. But it's a wonderful thing to forgive. The Bible says in Proverbs, it's our glory to pass over a transgression. Just forgive it. Father, thank you for speaking to our hearts. Oh, may there be a time of cleansing here tonight. In the hearts and lives of many folks. And help us, Lord, to realize you have forgiven us so, so much. How can we not forgive one another? So Lord, hear our prayer during this invitation time that we make to Thee. Cleanse our hearts as we confess our sin to You and cleanse us from all unrighteousness and unforgiveness. And let us put away all the wrath and the anger and the bitterness and the clamor and the evil speaking. Give us that kindness and that tender heartedness that we'll be forgiving one another even as you have forgiven us. Have your way now in this invitation. I'll thank you for it. 